there is there should be around about 500 we're just waiting for a few minutes there then i will introduce dr stander the president of saspio saspio kindly provides us with lectures for the next few weeks on tuesdays for the oral health month thank you saspio for that uh, availability we do appreciate that um, it seems as if the attendees are stabilized uh, i'm going to uh, let, i think we can start and we can go through there dr suzette stanner is the president of saspio she will introduce our uh, speaker and uh, i'm going to hand over to dr stanner at this stage dr stanner good evening everyone um it is saspio's honor tonight to welcome dr amira frugi um, to tonight's webinar and um, we're very happy that he was willing to come and speak to us tonight about the value of needle aspiration or brush biopsy in the diagnosis of oral lesions. So just to give a little bit of background of Dr. Amir Afrugi, Dr. Amir is a principal oral pathologist lecturer as well as specialist at the University of the Western Cape's dental faculty in Cape Town. He obtained his bachelor degree in dental surgery from UWC in 2004, and then his master's of dental surgery in oral, in oral and maxillofacial pathology in 2011, as well as his PhD um, from UWC in 2018. He is the first oral pathologist to graduate from Harvard Medical School in Massachusetts General Hospital in June 2015 with a fellowship in head and neck pathology. He is also the first to graduate from the University of Stellenbosch with a master's degree in the subspeciality of cytopathology. He is an international fellow of the College of the American Pathologists as well as member of the Endocrine Pathology um, Society. He has been a regular invited speaker at major national and international pathology meetings. Amir has also published over 40 peer-reviewed papers in reputed, reputed um, international journals and conferences, and he has authored several chapters in pathology textbooks. His main um, areas of research interests include thyroid and um, oral cytopathology, HPV-induced cancers of the head and neck region, as well as molecular pathogenesis of adenoid cystic carcinoma. Now, in recognition of all his work, he has received numerous awards and prizes, and to name just but a few, um, he received an International Academy of Pathology Rob Kashula Award, um, he was also um, the best early career, he received the best early career research award at UWC. He was um, received the, at the University of Stellenbosch best research award, and he was one of five um, cancer researchers in the country that was nominated um, for the prestigious um, Utle Memorial Award um, of the Cancer Association of South Africa in 2019. So Dr. Amira Fruki, thank you for availing your time to us tonight and to come and enlighten us more on this subject. We really look forward to it. Dr. Amir, before you uh, speak, I just want to uh, introduce, uh, to say something else. I forgot to do all the introductions. <laughs> uh, sorry for that. I just want to ask everyone to refrain from uh, using the raise a hand function. Uh, and rather use the question and answer tab in the uh, platform that is available. Tonight's lecture is one uh, clinical CEU point. Uh, it will be available on the SADAR website. Um, Non-members can register on the website, uh, uh, register a profile there and get the points from there. Uh, people that can't get onto the Zoom platform, it will be available on the YouTube uh, streaming as well. Uh, and then this, uh, we had a, or there was supposed to be a, a webinar on the 10th on the uh, I Survived Coded and it's been postponed indefinitely. It, uh, Zepo sent out an email on that and it will be, um, uh, you will be notified when, when it'll, it'll happen again. Dr. Amir, sorry for that. Uh, you can continue with your lecture. Thank you. 
Um, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Swanepoel and um, Dr. Stonder for the introduction. Um, I will. So today's lecture is on the value of brush cytology in the diagnosis of oral lesions. Just to clarify the difference between histology and, 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 and um, cytology, histology is based on tissue biopsy. So you will see the architecture of the um, surface epithelium as well as the underlying connective tissue in histologic sections. Cytology on the other hand shows the exfoliated cells. So in cytology, you will be able to assess the cytomorphologic features or the cellular features, including the cytoplasm of the cells and the nuclei, but you will not be able to see the architecture that you see in histology. Very importantly, you cannot assess the invasion of possible malignant cells into the underlying connective tissue. So the science of cytopathology actually examines and allows examination of exfoliated cells from the cervix which is actually achieved by a brush exfoliating cells from the cervix during a gynae examination, or it allows examination of the cells that are aspirated from a palpable mass in the breast, for example, a submucosal mass in the oral cavity and enlarged lymph node, or a mass in the salivary glands and the thyroid gland, or it allows examination of um, exfoliate uh, aspirated cells from masses that are located in the deep seated organs such as liver and lung with the aid of an ultrasound. Also, it allows examination of cells, exfoliated cells in urine, sputum, cerebrospinal fluid, pleural effusions, and even exfoliated cells from the oral cavity. So the oral cytopathology is actually a branch of non gynae cytopathology. So oral cytopathology involves exfoliative cytology, and here we're only gonna concentrate on oral brush biopsy and also intraoral FNAP. So my talk today will be on exfoliative cytology, primarily oral brush biopsy, and we may have a lecture on intraoral FNAP later on. So like I discussed, cytology allows examination of individual cells, but cannot provide the histological features crucial for an accurate and definitive diagnosis of malignant invasion. For this reason, oral brush biopsy is typically used as a supplement to the incisional or excisional biopsy and not a substitute for excisional or incisional biopsy procedures. About 10% of the patients that present at your private practice have some type of an oral lesion. The good news is that the vast majority of these lesions are truly benign. However, clinical inspection cannot always differentiate precancerous and cancerous lesions from these common benign lesions. These precancerous and cancerous lesions only become detectable with an increasing size of the lesion. And we can see that the threshold is about a centimeter. So these precancerous and cancerous lesions usually only become detectable when the lesion is bigger than a centimeter. We have an example. We have a here a lesion on the lateral border of the tongue, and it is really difficult here to say that which area is the cancerous area. And in fact, that area proved to be the cancer, which is actually less than a centimeter. So you can see it's really difficult to, to, to detect lesions that are sub-centimeter. As the lesion gets bigger, like in this lesion on the lateral of the tongue, it becomes actually more obvious. And this lesion, this area here proved to be the cancer. Developing a screening test for oral cancer is actually problematic. Although we said that the surgical biopsy is the gold standard for the diagnosis, tissue biopsy is selected meaning that if you have got a very large area of mucosal change, you can only select a region for a tissue biopsy. So tissue biopsy is quite selective. As a screening test, tissue biopsy is quite time consuming because 
you want a screening test to be to be to be simple and quick procedure. It is also uncomfortable, not and it's done usually under local anesthesia and is relatively expensive. On the other hand, oral brush cytology is simple and minimally invasive. It adds no significant time to the routine examination procedure and collects atraumatically cells over a wider area. Oral brush cytology is usually well tolerated by the patients. And with the advent of liquid-based cytology and the um, introduction of cell blocks and microbiopsy, it promises to be a, real, a very reliable diagnostic test nowadays. The question is when to do a tissue biopsy and when to do a brush biopsy. Well, if you have got an obvious cancer or a highly suspicious lesion, we call these lesions class one lesions clinically, then you would like to do just a tissue biopsy and confirm the diagnosis. Also in a person that is at high risk of developing an oral cancer, such as a person who has had already oral cancer and is predisposed to having multiple other primaries, you may also do a tissue biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Also in a patient with a history of oral cancer, you can also perform a tissue biopsy and confirm the diagnosis. What are the indications for a bi brush biopsy? Brush biopsy is valuable in lesions with low levels of clinical concern. We call these lesions class two lesions. These are lesions that you would call most probably benign, but you're still not very sure and you would like to take a brush just to detect the cancer at the very earlier stage. A brush biopsy is also valuable in the detection of infections of the oral cavity. And you know that the most common infection occurring in the oral cavity is candidiasis. So and a brush biopsy is invaluable for the confirmation of the candidal high fee. It can also be used in some vesicular, vesicular bullous diseases such as pemphigus when you can detect the acantholytic cells. Like I discussed, the brush biopsy can also be very invaluable in lesions that are quite large. As we said, a tissue biopsy is quite selective. However, brush biopsy covers a larger area or larger surface of the lesion. Also, it can be of value in patients with bleeding tendencies. An example we had in the clinic a few years ago where a patient presented with an ulcer on the lateral border of the tongue in a non-risky patient. Unfortunately, the patient was, was on anticoagulant and the patient was then referred back to the practitioner and, and was lost for a few weeks before she could come back. When she came back, she presented with a large lymph node in the submandibular region. So these patients are actually ideal for a brush biopsy where a surgical biopsy can cause a lot of bleeding. Areas such as that are difficult to access are also quite good areas for a brush biopsy, such as anterior gingiva, where taking a biopsy can be difficult, especially cause problems with healing and aesthetics. A brush biopsy can also be invaluable after a patient has had an operation for oral cancer. When a patient can present in a suspicious with a suspicious lesions a few days, a few, a few days or a few months later in the region of the, of the operation, doing a surgical biopsy in, the, in that area may be difficult. So a brush biopsy again is very invaluable in this scenario. Also a brush biopsy can be of uh, the, 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 the method of choice in resource limited areas where surgical biopsy is not um, amenable um, and there are no instruments or um, 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 material to do the, 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 the surgical procedure. So brush biopsy, I mean, I think every clinic, even in the rural areas, will have uh, a cervical brush for you to do the brush biopsy. This is a good example. We said that a brush biopsy is actually valuable in lesions of low, uh, where, where you have low levels of clinical concern. You know, those are the lesions that are most prob probably benign. And this is a patient that presented to us about nine years ago with a lesion on the buccal mucosa. The patient was a 50 year old female with no risk factors and presented with these a small ulcer on the buccal mucosa. Given the history of no risk factors, 
being a healthy patient, vegan, and being very fit, we thought that this lesion on the buccal mucosa is most probably related to the sharp cusp of the tooth adjacent to it. So we reassured the patient and uh, sent the patient home. However, we did a brush biopsy before sending the patient home. The next day, we examined the smear and the smear indeed showed malignant cells. So you can see how important it was to catch the cancer at its very earlier stages. And to this day, the patient is actually disease free. So it's very important to catch the oral cancer at the earlier stages. For a stage one and two mouth cancer or the earlier stage cancer, more than 80% of the patients survive the oral cancer for three years or more. Whereas for the high stage cancers, the stage three and four oral cancers, only half of the patient survives the cancer for three years or more. A lot of clinicians also like to resort to toluidine blue to detect precancerous and cancerous area in a lesion. And the philosophy behind the toluidine blue is that the dye actually attaches to the abnormal DNA and the abnormal DNA is then highlighted in the areas. However, what is very important also to remember is that hyperplastic lesions can also stain with toluidine blue. So you can have false positivity with toluidine blue alone. Also, there are some precancerous lesions that will not stain with toluidine blue. So toluidine blue does not have this, the sensitivity and the specificity for detecting precancerous and cancerous lesions. However, it could be an ideal dye to select areas that you would like to do a brush biopsy or even a surgical biopsy. It will highlight those problematic areas. This is that buccal mucosal cancer or the lesion of low level of concern that I just discussed. The patient was referred to the surgeon and you can see there is another dye called the leucose iodine, which also works as best as toluidine blue. And you can see that here, it actually, the leucos iodine is of value as it highlights the entire lesion and prepares the lesion for the surgical procedure. It highlights the borders of the lesion and then the surgeon went in to then remove the lesion with, the, with, with laser excision. We also said that the brush biopsies are value in lesions that are very large. For example, this erythroleukoplakia on the lateral border of the tongue. The selective, the, the tissue biopsy is very selective, so you can only choose an area to do a biopsy. Unless you do field mapping, which means a number of biopsies in different areas that could be actually very uncomfortable for the patient and it will take a lot of time. But the brush biopsy will cover the entire surface of the lesion. Also, we said that the brush biopsy is of value in areas where you have got a very large lesion on the anterior gingiva. And this is the area very difficult also to biopsy the anterior gingiva because of the healing as well as the aesthetic for the patients. So a brush biopsy can cover this white lesion involving the anterior border of the gingiva. The question arises that which instrument should be used to collect the sample or the exfoliated cells? Before a lot of clinicians used to use a spatula, but a spatula has got an absorptive surface. That means that a lot of your cells that you collect gets absorbed into the spatula and cannot be transferred into the slide very well. The spatula also collects cells from the surface of the epithelium, from the superficial surface of the epithelium and may not collect the problem cells that lie in the lower layers of the epithelium. So spatula is not a very good instrument for, for collecting cells or, uh, from, from the surface. Also a metal spatula, although it's non-absorbent, it's, 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 um, non still it has got the ability to only collect cells from the superficial layers of the epithelium. A brush has been shown to be a very effective tool for um, collecting cells from the mucosal surface. However, if you look at it, and we have the picture of the brush here, and we have got a picture of a white lesion. The lesion appears white because the surface shows a lot of hyperkeratosis. So if you just 
a brush, if you just brush on the very gently on the lesion, you will only collect again your surface keratotic cells. And you will miss actually the problem cells that usually lie in the lower levels of the epithelium, that is the basal layer and the stratum spinosum or the middle layer. So what should we do with a brush in order for us to achieve um, a good biopsy and we have a representative sample of cells from all layers of the epithelium? I will discuss that in a bit later. So a superficial brush could be a very good tool for detecting candida organisms, such as candida hyphae, because the candida hyphae are usually found in the superficial layers of the epithelium, as you can see in this picture. And this is a brush cytology of candida hyphae taken from the superficial layers of the epithelium. So if you suspect candidiasis and you would like to confirm the presence of the candida hyphae, doing a superficial brush is just fine. However, if you want to detect the abnormal cells, which are sometimes located, as I said, in the lower levels of the epithelium, in your potentially malignant lesions or cancers, you need to do a trans-epithelial brush biopsy. And as you can see, the name says trans-epithelial, meaning collecting cells from all layers of the epithelium. During a trans-epithelial biopsy, you need to rotate the brush along the lesion clockwise, in a clockwise direction several times to cause pinpoint bleeding. Once you have bleeding, you will be assured that you are in the connective tissue area and you have a representative sample. So if you do a trans-epithelial brush biopsy, you will be able to collect cells from the superficial layers and you can collect the abnormal cells that are located in the lower levels of the lower layers of the epithelium. Compare the intermediate cells to the abnormal cells. As you can see the cytologic features of malignancy in these cells, there is an increase in nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio in comparison to that cell, and the nucleus is significantly enlarged and hyperchromatic. This is indeed a high grade lesion. This is a picture to represent the trans-epithelial biopsy pr procedure. You have a white lesion on the labial mucosa, and here we use a cervical brush, which is rotated along the lesion a few times to cause pinpoint bleeding. We have another lesion here on the lateral border of the tongue, and we have the brush, and we rotate the brush along the lesion several times to cause pinpoint bleeding. And in this way, we know that we have sampled cells from all layers of the epithelium. You might wonder that by causing bleeding, then this is a very painful procedure. In fact, what I do before I do the brushing procedure, I will just spray a few sprays of xylocaine spray. And you can then proceed uh, with your procedure, which is not that uncomfortable for the patient. In order to modify the brush even more and make it more abrasive and more penetrating, some clinicians like to use a plier to create a toilet brush. And this brush indeed is actually more penetrating and more abrasive, and it will provide a more effective way of collecting cells through all the layers of the epithelium. In fact, you don't need to modify the brush anymore. The oral CDX company in America provides the Orcelex brush. And this brush is actually more effective in doing a trans-epithelial brush biopsy. And you can adapt this brush to different, different areas of the oral mucosa. And as you can see, it's actually, it, apply, it actually helps you to apply more pressure and the brush is actually more abrasive and more penetrating in collecting cells from all layers of the epithelium. And as you can see with this brush, you can have a very good representation of all layers of the epithelium, including the basal cells, the stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, and the hyperkeratotic layer. Here's a picture that shows sampling from all layers of the epithelium from the basal cells to intermediate cells to superficial cells. Now that you have used the brush to 
brush the lesion and collect your cells, then what you would do, traditionally what we used to do is that you take out two slides and you label those slides with the names of the patients. Because you need to identify the patient when the slides get to the laboratory. So you also need a pencil too to do that. What, then what you do is you will smear your cells onto the glass slide. An effective way of doing that is actually by holding two slides next to one another and just rolling the brush in between the two slides. And then you will have a very good layer or a smear of cells over the two brushes. And then what you would do is to spray fix the slide. You need to hold the spray a little bit away from the, from the slide because you, would, you don't like to blow off all the material from the slide that you have collected. And then you will spray the slide very nicely with a spray to create a very nice and wet smear. You need to do that very quickly and spray fix the, the, the cells before they dry out. So you need to be quite quick. What are the problems with this method that I just showed you, though, the conventional oral psychology? You do cause a lot of bleeding, and when you smear the, um, uh, the blood over the, over, the, over the slide, you will cause bloody smears. And therefore, these red blood cells can actually, what they do, they conceal and hide your malignant cells. So therefore, the pathologist cannot see these cells properly and can actually call a smear or report a smear as negative. So you can have a false negative diagnosis. Also, we know that the oral cavity is filled with bacteria and lots of inflammatory cells. These inflammatory cells also can conceal and hide your malignant or your precancerous cells and also can contribute to a false negative diagnosis. As I told you, you need to be quite fast in fixing those cells on the slide as they can be dried out and they can be poorly preserved, which can result in difficulties in, in interpretation of the smears and contribute to false negative results. All of this actually resulted in a lack of interest in oral cytology in the, in, in the 1970s and the 1980s. So what can we do to address this procedure, to address this, this, this problem? So ideally, this is what you want, but this is not uh, ideal with the conventional cytology has just showed. A lot of the smears are bloody and are filled with inflammatory cells and bacteria. As you can see here below this on the pap smear part, this is the conventional way of doing things. So this is a brush hold in the hand of the, of the, of the clinician. You collect a sample and when you want to transfer it onto the slide, only 20% of the cells that you have collected gets into the slide. So about 80% of the cells will go to waste. Also, I told you, you need to be very quick and very fast to fix the cells as they will dry out. And this will result in poor preservation and the presence of artifacts. And the pathologist will not be very happy in examining such a smear. In 20, early 20, 2010 and 2011, we had the introduction of liquid-based cytology. So this is a much more easier way. You collect your cells with a brush and then you immerse or put your brush in a liquid that is the fixative and immediately fixes all the cells. What it also does this liquid based is that the liquid preservative will take away a lot of the inflammation at, and a at lot of the red blood cells. So the smears are nice and clean for the pathologist to examine. So you can see it's quite very easy. Indeed, um, now we have available even in South Africa, and it's a kit. So you have got the Orcelex brush, and you have got the liquid-based medium or the preservative. And the procedure is now very simple. You don't need to do that anymore. Smear the brush over. So what you only do after you have collected your samples, you, must, you, will, you can just Im immerse your brush into the liquid-based preservative. What we usually do is that we actually cut off the head of the brush and leave it in the liquid-based medium and then send it to the laboratory. This is if you don't have access to the Orcelex brush. It will easily cut off and then you can send it to the laboratory. But with the Orcelex brush, things are even made easier. 
I have a video for you of how to do this brushing, which is a very simple and easy procedure. Hi, so we're going to show you how to use the Orslix brush to take a sample in the oral cavity of a patient. Using the Orslix brush by Rovers, the brush is inserted into the oral cavity and the lesion bed is brushed 10 times in a clockwise direction until contact bleeding is achieved. The brush is removed and using the Cytovich vial, the head of the brush is inserted, sliding forward the see-through sheath into the large hole into the cytorich fluid and the vial is closed. And, and then what you will do after you have collected the sample is very easy. You will fill in a form like this and with patient's details and you can even tell us where you have taken the sample for, for us. There is also an area on the form where you can actually mention whether you have done a superficial brush or a transepithelial brush or whether you would like some further investigation such as HPV testing. So you can see it's quite a very easy procedure. And as you can see with the liquid-based cytology, you know you don't need to waste your time with a lot of slides and you can have just a single slide to examine the cells that are free of red blood cells. These are actually some nice smears of liquid-based preparations. You can actually compare this with the old conventional cytology, you can see with the current conventional cytology, you have a lot of inflammatory cells and the cells are not quite visible, but with the liquid-based cytology, you can see a very good layer of cells that are quite visible, which makes and reduce, improves the quality of the smears and reduces false positivity and false negativity. Here is an example of reactive cells that have got vacuolated cytoplasm. You can see the background is quite nice and clean. The number of inflammatory cells has been reduced quite significantly. So it's quite pleasant for the pathologist to examine liquid-based preparations. Professor Hiller and I did a study in 2010. Um, it was one of the first studies in the oral cavity um, to put the, to the test the um, um, oral liquid-based cytology, and we obtained very good results uh, with very good sensitivity and specificity, and we even proposed a new liquid-based oral cytology grading system. This is some of the results of our study. You can see that the smears are quite nice and colorful to look at from reactive to high-grade lesions to invasive squamous cell carcinomas where you can see a keratin pearl. Also what you can do with the liquid-based cytology is quite nice. What you can do is that the uh, sample that you have collected in the liquid-based medium, you can ask the lab to spin the sample down and create a, a sediment. And then you can put that sediment in formalin and you can create even a microbiopsy. This is what we call a cell block or a microbiopsy. And then you can even do additional investigations on these cell block or the microbiopsy. We have an example here. And this patient presented uh, with a, a large lesion uh, on, the, on, on, on the labial mucosa that which suspected has been caused by a mouth rinse. Initially, we took the brush and we did not find enough cells. So what we did is that we asked the lab to spin down the, uh, the, the, the fluid and create a microbiopsy. And you can see that the microbiopsy or the cell block is actually quite nice to look at. And we had a lot of necrotic and dead cells. So this dead tissue or this death or tissue injury is the result of the mouth rinse. Like I said, it's quite nice to do additional things with liquid-based cytology. You can test the liquid for the presence of high-risk HPV, or what you can do is to stain the cells that you have obtained um, to find and classify these, uh, these cells, or to do additional investigations. Also with liquid-based cytology, what is very nice is that a lot of those, um, the, 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 the sample that you get and the cells can then be transferred into a computer and a computer has got, there are some software programs there that can pick up your atypical cells. And then these images can then be shared with colleagues around the world. 
currently we are busy with a number of um, cytology, liquid-based cytology projects. And we can see we have a team in Africa. Uh, we have got uh, collaborative colleagues in Zambia. We have got collaborative colleagues in Ghana, Ghana as well as in Kenya. This is Dr. Lillian um, Ndonga, or uh, a registrar in oral pathology, who is currently looking at liquid-based cytology um, of uh, uh, or the cytomorphologic features or in the oral cavity of the patients who are chewing mirror or cut. Also, she's looking at the incidence of oral HPV infection uh, in, in, in these population. And there's a number of people who are actually um, uh, collaborating with our, our, our projects from um, uh, Dr. Neil Wood, who is actually um, um, uh, Professor Neil Wood, who is um, uh, from Medunsa and is doing his PhD on uh, um, oral liquid-based cytology, looking at the prevalence of oral HPV infection in the Kharanko area. And I just, uh, just discussed uh, Dr. Um, Lillian Ndonga's project. Dr. Khidian Fantonde, who just uh, demonstrated how to do a brush, is a registrar in ear, ear, nose, and throat pathology, and he's doing a project with me um, looking at uh, the prevalence of, again, oral HPV infection in the Western Cape area, as well as looking at the cytomorphologic um, the, um, features looking using the short path uh, um, liquid-based cytology system. Also, Professor Hila and I are both involved uh, in these projects. I would actually like to end my talk with a few examples to look at the value of uh, oral brush cytology. Um, this is a patient who presented um, uh, in 2015, and I can recall this case quite vividly in uh, uh, Christmas, uh, December, during Christmas time. It was a 40 year old uh, female. She was a non smoker and presented to the oral med clinic at, Tage, at, at uh, Tageberg Hospital with erythroleukoplakia of the lateral border of the tongue. And as you can see, it's quite a, a, a large lesion. And, as, uh, and uh, then the clinician went in to do a, a selective tissue biopsy. So she only selected one area and did the biopsy. And as you can see, that we, I, on, on first biopsy, what I only saw is hyperkeratosis. I only saw hyperkeratosis. However, I uh, phoned back the clinician and told the clinician that this is a very large lesion and this may not be representative. Why don't you uh, do a brush biopsy as it will cover a larger surface of the lesion? And she did the brush biopsy, as you can see, and you can see that the brush biopsy is actually much better than the first um, surgical biopsy she did. It shows these group of cells that have shown high NC ratio, meaning that the nuclei are bigger, they are more dark and uglier, and it was, this is actually a very high grade lesion. You can also see here, single cell with this high NC ratio, irregular nuclear membranes, and a very dark chromatin. Also, what I found on this knee, I found this very large abnormal mitotic figures, and then I phoned back the clinician to tell her that, that, that uh, this is a high grade lesion, and this is most probably cancer. Can you do another biopsy? Uh, from some other area, and indeed she did the second biopsy, and here you go, you will see a lot, you will see the invasive squamous cell carcinoma infiltrating below the basement membrane. Also, I wanted to show you the value of oral brush biopsy. We know that in recent years, uh, there has been a, a, a decrease in the number of uh, uh, alcohol and tobacco associated cancers in the oral cavity. But on the other hand, the incidence of oropharyngeal cancers has been increasing and epidemiolo epidemiologic studies have linked actually high risk HPV infections to cancers of the tonsils and the base of tongue. And uh, um, oral sex seems to be the number one risk factors for these cancers. And with the increase in the number of oral sex partners, the risk of acquiring uh, a high risk HPV infection in the oral cavity and the throat actually increases. A lot of these patients who present with these um, uh, tonsillar and the basal tongue cancers are below 50 years of age um, um, in comparison to your HPV negative cancers, which are usually seen in patients over 50 years of age. A lot of these patients uh, are non-smokers in comparison to the smokers as we just uh, talked about, are of higher socioeconomic uh, status and report more oral sex partners. As we know that the high-risk HPV, um, um, uh, just to remind you a little bit on the biology of the high-risk HPV infection, we know that uh, high-risk HPV does, um, does um, 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 
uh, encodes two pro important proteins, E6 and E7. E your, the E7 high-risk HPV oncoprotein binds to a retinoblastoma protein, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And by binding to that, it will cause overexpression of P16. So when we see overexpression of P16 in a tumor, we can say that it is related to high-risk HPV infection, particularly in the, in the tonsils and the base of tongue. So this patient presented to our clinic, it was a 48-year-old male. He was a non-smoker with a suspicious ulcerating lesion in the right tonsil. So you can see it's actually the right age, below 50 years of age, it's a non-smoker, it's a male, and it actually fits the profile of somebody who, is, who can uh, present with uh, 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 HPV positive tonsillar cancer. So what I did, I sprayed a bit of Zolocaine and I brushed the area. As you can see, I have a very nice smear. You can see we have got a, a group of, uh, of, of uh, highly atypical cells that are showing dark chromatin, high NC ratio. You can even see some multinucleated cells around here. So what I asked for is to spin down the, uh, the, 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 the material that I collected or the liquid-based medium to create a microbiopsy where you can see actually the morphology, this, this microbiopsy or the tissue biopsy, you can see the morphology of the cells quite better. And you can see there is a lot of desmosomes between the cells and this is characteristic of a squamous cell carcinoma. And then because it was from the tonsil and the base of tongue, by definition, you need to do some high-risk HPV testing. And I need the P16 and you can see that the P16 is quite a strong here. We also further tested the liquid by polymerase chain reaction, PCR, and we detected high-risk HPV. So you can see it's quite nice. Um, you can do the tonsillar brush and uh, you can actually uh, then mark the area to do high risk HPV testing by way of P16 and PCR uh, on, on, on the liquid base. Sometimes also some people would like to know whether they have got high risk HPV in the oral cavity or not. Uh, this is also something, you know, a patient can request from you. You can do it easily, but the as you know, the presence of high-risk HPV in the oral cavity does not um, equate um, the, the presence of transcriptionally active virus, and the virus can just be passengers. And the last examples that I can, I'm, uh, and I'm going to show you is a 15, and this one actually broke all the traditional boundaries of using a brush, and this is this surgeon actually got quite creative with the brush here. This is a 15 year old female who presented to the oral surgery clinic with a multilocular radiolucency of the right maxilla, which actually perforated the cortex and uh, presented out of the cortex. So what the surgeon did actually brushed uh, the, um, the, the lesion uh, uh, as it broke out of the cortex into the maxilla and put it on the smear and then send it to me. And you can see it's quite nice. It's quite very cellular. And even from this magnification, you can actually recognize these huge giant cells here. And as I get very closer, I can see um, uh, a giant cell. I can see these mononuclear cells. And if I look even very more carefully, I will see the granular um, um, deposits of hemosiderin pigment, which are the result of hemorrhage. So given the plump cells, the, um, the giant cells, and the, uh, um, and the hemosiderin uh, deposits, I could clearly tell the surgeon that this is indeed a, a central uh, giant cell granuloma. So you can see that uh, how um, uh, you can get creative with a, with a brush in the oral cavity. And with that, I uh, thank you for your um, attention and participation in this lecture. Thank you. Dr. Amir, thank you for this informative lecture. I just want to see these chats. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, before we go, uh, I would uh, like to, to give time for the participants to uh, ask their questions on the Zoom question on the platform. Uh, before I'm going to hand over to Dr. Steiner to do that, I just want to uh, inform the participants that uh, Cargat gave us a uh, lucky draw and uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Amir to give us a number between 1 and 511 uh, for the participant that's uh, lucky enough to get that uh, lucky draw there. And then at the end of the le lecture, there's also going to be questions uh, that you must just answer uh, before uh, leaving the, the uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, Dr. Amir, can you give us a number? 
Uh, uh, we can't hear you. Just uh, unmute yourself. Okay, I will. I will choose an unlucky number, number thirteen. <laughs> number thirteen. <laughs> Okay, let's see. The, the unlucky, lucky person is Dr. Shabana Ali. Uh, Colgate will be with uh, in contact with you and the uh, lucky draw will be delivered to you before the end of October. Dr. Stunner, can you have a look at the questions? Yes, thank you, Dr. Swanable. Dr. Amir, we have a few questions um, from YouTube. Um, uh, a question, first question is, if a brush biopsy is taken from an erythroleukoplakia and comes back as dysplastic cells, how would you then rule out squamous cell carcinoma? Surely you need an incision biopsy. And then the second question is, we know that some squamous cell carcinomas arise in apparently normal overlying epithelium. Surely a brush biopsy will give a false negative in this case. <clears throat> Maybe you can give us a little bit of feedback there. Sure. So uh, the, like I said, we have got a grading system. And if the, uh, the, the lesion comes back, depending on the, on, the, on the degree of dysplasia, if it is, comes back as a high-grade lesion or high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, then usually um, the, the, the clinician will follow up with a biopsy for confirmation. If it comes back uh, as uh, probably a reactive low grade, you need to look at the clinical picture too and take that both into account. Uh, some people may like to um, uh, recall the patient depending on the lesion that they're seeing, if it is not very suspicious and uh, perform a re uh, brushing of the lesion uh, or maybe a biopsy at a later date. So it depends on your uh, type of displeasure that you, 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 you are dealing with. And then the other question that you asked Dr. Stonda, I could, didn't get that question uh, quite right. Sure, I can repeat it for you. Um, we know that some squamous cell carcinomas arise in apparently normal overlying epithelium. So surely a brush biopsy will give a false negative in this case. So I think they want to know how accurate is the brush biopsy. I guess what they meant is that the cancer can develop just below the surface epithelium, which can do that in the, in the oral cavity. So like I said, doing a trans epithelial brush biopsy will actually help you in, 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 that, uh, in, that, in, that, in that scenario. Perfect, then we've got another question. Um, they would just like to know where they can get the brush biopsy kits um, if you're working in private practice. So the, 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 the kits are quite readily available now in Pathcare. So Pathcare is actually one uh, uh, um, um, private pathology laboratory can, that can, that can um, offer you the kits, both the uh, Orcelex brush as well as the liquid-based medium. I am not sure about the other private pathology laboratories, but Pathcare does provide that to, to, the, to the dentist as well as the periodontist and oral surgeons. Thank you, Doctor. Then we also have a question here on the Q&A tab. In South Africa, is um, what's the prevalence rate of HPV in men between 40 to 60? Okay, that is actually a, a, a very good question. We actually did um, a, a study looking primarily at the prevalence of high-risk HPV infection at Tigerberg Hospital. I mean, my registrar from Ghana that I showed Gloria Dapa, uh, uh, Dr. Gloria Dapa did the study, to, uh, we did that study together. And we found actually a very low incidence of, of, of this cancer at Targeberg Hospital, somewhere around about 3% or, 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 or 5%. Um, um, probably the Targeberg Hospital is actually not a very good um, place to um, uh, look at the prevalence of these cancers because a lot of these patients who present to us usually present with tobacco and alcohol related cancers and they are not people of high socioeconomic status. So I actually don't know the true prevalence of HPV positive or of pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma uh, um, um, really um, um, in, in, in this country or in the Western Cape region. So I will not be able to, to, to give you a figure. Maybe we are busy with a study looking at a multi-institutional study to look at a true prevalence of, of, of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, we, I don't have true figures uh, for you in our country. 
Then a question I have, um, fine needle aspiration, um, is that also something that you would recommend more for the cystic lesions or salivary gland lesions? And how accurate is that? Sorry for throwing that in there. Hey, sure, uh, Suzette. Actually, fine needle aspiration was part of the talk, but I thought that uh, uh, maybe we can give that talk at, at, at a later stage because uh, um, uh, otherwise we would have taken a lot of time. I only had 45 minutes. But five needle aspiration, again, has been proven to be a very good tool, especially in the diagnosis of salivary gland lesions that we usually uh, encounter in the oral, oral, oral cavity. I mean, I have had a few of those with you. We have done a few publications on that. Yeah, so five needle aspiration is very good for intraoral submucosal masses. The brush is actually indicated for mucosal surface lesions, and you can do a, a fine needle aspiration of submucosal uh, um, um, lesions. Actually, not a few days ago, I had a consult and um, a, a dentist actually um, not, did a fine needle aspiration of a mucosil, um, which actually quite landed up to be quite very nice and pleasant to look at with a lot of mucophages and inflammatory cells. Because you know, sometimes you will have difficulty uh, also um, distinguishing a mucosil from a mucopidermal carcinoma because both of them can present with mucin. Yes, it's a very good tool and uh, especially in the detection of salivary gland lesions, uh, fine aspiration biopsy has a very high sensitivity and a specificity and hopefully we'll have a lecture next time where we can talk about FNABs. Amir, thank you for all your um, insight. And I think this was an excellent, well-prepared lecture. The feedback that we're getting here on the Q&A session says the same. I think everyone enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And I think it- Thank, what thank you very much. Thank you, what, what um, I think what is useful from a take home message that we can have from tonight is, this is a, a trans epithelial brush biopsy is a useful tool to use in, to have in our private practices everywhere. It's easy, we can get quick reassurance for our patients. We don't have to delay or traumatize a patient with doing, um, you know, incision or surgical biopsies immediately. So thank you for explaining everything to us. I really appreciate it. And I think we all enjoyed it. You're welcome, uh, Dr. Stone. Thank you very much. And thank you for all. Uh, I just want to thank all the participants on this. Thank you very much for attending this uh, lecture. Dr. Amir, Dr. Stan, Stanner, thank you for, for availing Dr. Uh, Amir with this lecture from the SASPIO side. Uh, we do really do appreciate that. Uh, please, before you go, there's, there'll be questions uh, on the uh, Zoom platform that you must just answer, uh, and then you can leave the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Um, pan panelists, will you just stay on until the uh, participants has left? Thank you. Gum problems? Neglecting your gums can start a chain reaction leading to serious problems. Meridol. The Swiss gum expert helps fight the cause of gum problems. So they don't get worse. Meridol. Healthy gums, healthy teeth. Exclusively available in pharmacies.